the esteemed uh, dignitaries on the dais, very, very distinguished audience, uh, comprising, I think, all the corporate top honchos of the country. I hope you're now a much more enlightened lot after the whole day's deliberations with government, former government, manufacturing focus, good governance focus. I think you've had a whole day full of gyan. And that's something we politicians, I think, are infamously famous for giving out. I don't know how much we practice as much as we can easily preach. We've just had a vote on account, something which uh, really is only a holding on operation, a little bit of an opportunity for the government to give us core card of what it has been able to achieve. A lot said which was not uh, done, and a lot remained unsaid which could have been done better. But we'll not get into the past, uh, as the Honorable Finance Minister said. Let's leave it for history to judge his achievements or his government's achievements. In any case, uh, I think they have uh, reconciled to the fact that they are getting into history. So let's focus on the future. Let's focus on a brighter and a much more empowered future for our nation as I see the country going forward. Certainly, I'm no cynic. I don't give up easily. I don't believe all is lost. And I am very, very clear that the winds of change that we are witnessing almost across the length and breadth of this country, the anger we are witnessing in the youth of the nation, the anger we are witnessing amongst households, the homemakers against inflation, against corruption at different levels, petty corruption, the corruption at the top, the ill effects that we are seeing in the entire economy of short-term measures of fiscal profligacy, the fact that we lost excellent opportunities in the last four or five years, I think, to take the country onto another trajectory instead of going down the path that the nation did in the last four or five years. I'm quite sure that going forward, I see the nation bouncing back once again to double-digit growth, I, I can clearly see before me seven or eight steps that can once again revive the economy, put some control into the runaway inflation that we've seen in the last six years, reignite the investment cycle, kickstart the growth story, and end of the day, meet the aspirations of the people. And to my mind, the real story before the nation now is one of jobs. Any new government that comes in another three months from now, the first priority that it will have to address, it will have to focus all its energies and attentions and policies will be to creation of jobs. I have used this statistic ad nauseum. You might have heard it in the past. But I do believe the very fact that Mr. Vajpayee's policies, the policies of the NDA, created 60 million jobs between 2000 and 2005, is a testimony to good governance. It's, it's a testimony to actually bringing some sort of fiscal discipline in the running of government, which Mr. Vajpayee is credited with. And the fact that despite having over 9% growth in the subsequent four or five years, particularly in UPA 1, we actually saw a period of consumption-led jobless growth. We saw a period where reforms are almost stalled, whether one were to call it the compulsions of coalition politics or failure of imagination. It also was that period which, while many people often try to suggest that UPA 1 was good, it's UPA 2 which is the problem. I personally believe the UPA 2 is only reaping what UPA once sowed. Ultimately, the large amount of corruption, the fact that reforms were stalled for five years, maybe at the back of the left front supporting the then government, I think the fact that during that period, because the world was doing very well, we just tended to move along, and instead of saving for the future, instead of strengthening our finances, we let loose the purse strings and let the money flow possibly with the intention of getting some uh, better electoral results. I think all of those steps put together caused an election to be won 
but a nation to be lost. And UPA too clearly has reflected what, what could go wrong in the economy. We've seen growth tumbling down to 4.5% is what we've been indicated today. Inflation has been relentless. Current account has bothered the nation. I mean, we have an external debt which is close to $400 billion today. So while we may claim that there's been some traction on foreign exchange reserves, in fact, the minister himself uh, tried to allude to an increase of $15 billion in foreign exchange reserves this year. But I think when you juxtapose it with the burgeoning external debt, that figure pales. In fact, it gets into negative territory. So I think the pressing need before any new government would be to set its four or five things in order with a focus ultimately being on job creation. The five years, 2005 to 10, saw only 2.7 million jobs being created. I see in this nation a requirement for at least 200 million jobs. Considering the fact that we have large underemployment in the agricultural sector, I mean, 50% of India cannot sustain itself on agriculture, with only 15% of the GDP coming out of agriculture. We certainly cannot have a situation anymore where manufacturing stagnates at 15% for over 10, 12 years now. There's been absolutely no traction on the manufacturing side. If you see the excise duty figure of 2013-14, the revised figure given today, it's absolutely flat. 76,000 crores, 12-13. 76,000 crores, 1340. It's a clear indication of where the manufacturing sector is going. So I see these 200 million jobs as the central theme around which any future government will have to plan its programs, plan its policies. And to enable 200 million people to become, to get an employment or a working opportunity, I think the single most important program before any new government will be the skill development program. I mean, to my mind, unless we can actually create working capabilities, we can actually harness the vocational interests of our youth into different skills. And uh, Mr. Modi had uh, actually mapped out all the skills that a human being uh, is touched with in his life from womb to tomb. And he found that there are 5,000 skills that people in a way need in this country, which affect all our lives. It could be as simple as just sweeping the floor or driving our cars. And skill development, which in China, for example, has got the highest priority. They're looking at skilling something like 200, 300 million people over the next five years. We plan to skill 50 million people in the, in the 12th plan, five-year plan. We plan to skill, uh, I think, uh, nine lakh people in the current year, which is going by right now. But the figures that we saw today in the budget are dismal. We have actually created skills of something like 3 lakh people in the whole year, 3 lakh 17,000 people, and largely private sector driven. The government has skilled only 80,000 people. And a skill development corporation headed by an illustrious person such as Mr. Ramadurai, is starved for two years for an office place to work out of, is given a thousand crores in the 12-13 budget, which is withdrawn at the end of the year, and then given another thousand crores in 13-14 budget, of which only 300 crores are finally allocated. I think any government will have to look at skilling 200 million people in the next 10 years, will have to allot significant resources to that, engage the private sector into it, and possibly dovetail it with a program like the Manrega. Why should the Manrega be just giving out money for digging holes and filling them back in? The fact of life is that skilling would require about five, seven, ten thousand 10,000 rupees per person. Skilling would also require a stipend to be paid to the person. Today, a common man, a poor man says, I don't have two square meals to eat to feed my children. How am I going to go for five months to learn to become a mason or a carpenter? We could possibly budget a 20,000 rupees per person expenditure, give him 10, 12, 13,000 rupees as a stipend or a voucher for coming to learn that skill, enable him, empower him with knowledge, with technology, with, with some sort of income earning ability. 
and use the 40,000 crores every year that we probably spend on Manrega to skill two, uh, two, you know, two crore people, 20 million people every year and in 10 years, you can actually put that money to create a nation of employable working people. And then, of course, comes the four or five areas where, skill, where these skills can be exploited or where we can actually create jobs. And I'll just list four for your consideration. I believe the one low-hanging fruit which we've missed out on for years altogether is tourism. Planning Commission says 78 jobs are created for every million rupees spent on the, in the tourism sector. India as a nation still does not even allot 500 or 1,000 crores for tourism. Can we not as a nation plan that instead of the measly 6.8 million foreign tourists that come to India every year or came last year, can we not in 10 years imagine 65 million tourists coming to India? It would still be less than what France gets at 83 million. A country like uh, Turkey, small country, I mean, I, I don't know, other, other than the Blue Mosque and the Bosphorus River, I didn't find a third place and some of the trinkets on the, in the uh, bazaars there. I didn't find a third thing to do in Turkey. It still attracts 33 million tourists. It's beautifully marketed. It's, it's well maintained. It offers a lot of nightlife. It offers a lot of tourism excitement for potential tourists. Now, just imagine 60 million tourists come to India. The current $17 billion that we earn in foreign exchange from tourism could actually be $200 million. Where will that next wave, which the IT sector brought to India, the IT sector gave us 10 years of wonderful foreign exchange earnings, but I don't know if another 10 years can be sustained on the back alone of the IT sector. Where is that large amount of job growth and foreign exchange earnings going to come from, if not tourism. Another sector, which of course is very dear to most of you here, is manufacturing. Now, we've had manufacturing policy being announced in 2011. We've had the DMIC corridor being announced. Today, they announced there'll be two more corridors or three more corridors. Now, I think what, what the BJP believes is it's time to move out from acts and proposals and promises into an action mode. I mean, it's something typically like what Mr. Modi did with the Sabarmati River. Mumbai has a Mitti River, if any of you are aware of, the one which caused that infamous flood way back in 2006. We've already spent over 2,000 crores or 1,500 crores with absolutely no impact to dredge that river, clean it, desilt it, or expand it. And if any of you has been to Gujarat, and I would urge you to go and have a look, at how a successful government-driven project can be done in a time-bound fashion, within cost and budget estimates, and actually transform an entire area to make it, make it beautiful, make it a true tribute to the father of the nation. It's after all where Mahatma Gandhi's Sabarmati Ashram is situated. Similarly, the manufacturing sector as a whole will have to be addressed to find out where are the pain points. What are the pain points that we need to address? I wanted to throw a proposition. Can we not plan for a plug and play policy on manufacturing where it's government's job in a time bound fashion to get you your mine, your mining lease, your environment approval, your power, your water, your linkage to the common effluent treatment plant, your PPA signed, and then package all of that and maybe find a transparent price discovery mechanism Maybe auction it, maybe bid it, maybe a reverse auction on the net. And let the best man win, implement it. He goes to the bank, bank has the confidence, which sadly it doesn't today, that the process is clean, the process is above board. All approvals were taken by the government. There's no greasing of palms in the whole process. And there's a project which if they finance, <coughs> can be started for implementation in two months, won't have potential project overruns won't be stuck because the environment ministry is having a turf war with the finance ministry for historical reasons, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's a situation where we really need to understand from ladies and gentlemen like you here, where are the pain points, what needs to be done, what you need us to address. I mean, a simple thing like governance can be sorted out. I think not by RTI, 
but by actually <coughs> removing the discretionary powers wherever we can, and should there be need to take a discretionary decision by a government official or a minister or a politician, can we not suomoto put a speaking order for taking that discretionary order on the net? Can it not be in public domain why a minister decided to go away from established policy? He writes a speaking order and it's on the net so there's no future threat of a blackmail. There's no future threat that somebody would have some privileged information through RTI, go to the courts or go to the press, sensationalize it, bankers get scared, and you bring the whole, probably a sector or a segment into disrepute. So I think manufacturing needs action, actionable points can be drawn up. It's not rocket science. I mean, China did not do something which was very extraordinary. They are people who thought through the process, they planned how they will expand manufacturing and they achieved 32, 33% GDP share out of manufacturing. We can keep crying that we want to do 25% and we have set up a policy. I don't think policies is what you're looking for. You're looking for actual achievement of those policies. Today, you know, I was surprisingly going through, we get a document, I have it here, implementation of budget promises. And it's unreal. So you give a promise that for the working woman, I will create a new scheme and invest so much money. And then you say that we've set up a working group to decide the scheme. The scheme is under consideration of the departmental committee. And you say action completed. But that's not what people want. If there was a scheme to be done for working women, it has to be actionated on the ground, not in the government files and offices. So I think manufacturing is something we can seriously sit down and work on. Mr. Vajpayee had introduced the SEZ policy, which over the last 10 years has got badly mauled. There's been probably a lot of collateral reasons for approving six, 700 SEZs. Even the genuine ones today have become sick. Then they changed the laws on DDT and MAT without grandfathering the past, but that's something they're very infamous for having done on more than one law. And you landed up in a situation that a good policy an infrastructure creating policy, an enabling policy, is today in shatters. I don't know any SEZ which is coming up as we speak today. The third thing I think we can focus on as a nation is housing. Clearly, Mr. Vajpayee's one big thrust area was construction and housing. And to my mind, we need 100 million homes for the poor or the lower middle class, 100 million homes. And in, in my humble opinion, that cannot happen with government intervention in the form of subsidies, tax-free inputs, low, uh, government uh, giving free houses. I think those days are gone. Neither is it feasible to do, neither it can, it can be done to scale, and neither can it be done honestly. I was in fact suggesting, and I'm, I'm trying to work the whole scheme through, and I've talked to Rajiv Memani and a couple of other friends, can we not have a project or a proposal where really people in a room as small as this can run a trillion dollar project to create 100 million homes, rural and urban, but the only intervention government does is an interest subvention scheme. You make it affordable for people to own a home. The poorest of poor, if you ask him to pay 500 rupees a month, and give him a 400 square foot house with maybe solar lighting to light up his home, maybe a solar cooker or uh, water coming into his house and a small toilet. He will beg, borrow, steal, he'll work his, uh, his life out. I won't use any other term. <laughs> but he'll make sure he doesn't default. You know, any bankers here will tell you the housing loans, real estate housing loans, have the lowest MPA in India. It's less than 1%. And, and the incremental economic activity, the incremental taxes that this business gives you, I mean, it's something, it's not a revenue foregone as some of my other esteemed colleagues often come and bash all of you with. These 100 million homes are not being constructed. Should they be constructed, they will actually be giving you an incremental government and incremental revenue of 20, 25%. Because anybody in construction will tell you the the contracts tax, the sales tax, tax on steel, cement, labor, all of that put together is about 20, 25% of the cost of construction. 
That money can be used as a corpus. That money can be used to actually do the interest subvention. And over three or four years, as it is, we stand committed to reduce and bring down interest rates to real levels, realistic levels, like the days of Lord when Mr. Vajpayee was the Prime Minister. And you remember, you used to borrow at 6 and 7% those days, not at the 13 and 14 which you are paying today. And can Indian manufacturing compete with China, with the rest of the world, paying these kind of ridiculous interest rates? Can we import goods at 62, 65 rupees to a dollar? Can we actually sustain an economy, sustain infrastructure at these kind of interest rates? So I think clearly we need to address the housing issue. I'm fairly confident that given an opportunity in 10 years, we will make sure every human being in India, every family in India lives in a decent home, a home which has running water, a home which has power, a home which has sanitation, a toilet within its precincts, and a home which has a road outside its, on, at its door. That is the commitment we have. And that project itself, when I did the calculation, can create 15 million jobs just the housing project over the next 10 years. And lastly, of course, all of this is only possible if we were to do connectivity and infrastructure development. What Mr. Modi articulated, for example, in terms of the high-speed train network or expanding the highway networks. A lot of uh, naysayers tried to suggest that, oh, how is he going to get the land for the trains? How is he going to expand the roads? The problem is one of innovative thinking, not lack of possibilities. I think all we need to do, and all of you are so much better than any of us, and I'm sure with your guidance and with your support, we'll be able to come up with solutions for each one of these issues. For example, the bullet trains. I don't need to acquire a single acre of land for the bullet trains. I just need to go on top. I have an existing 66,000 kilometers of railways the world and technology has progressed enough that I could just have an elevated corridor in which the bullet trains would just go above the existing rail network. I don't see any, uh, any inhibition or any problem of land acquisition. Mr. Modi, when he had a problem in his state of expanding the highways, whether it was a temple, whether it was a church, whether it was a mosque, he was unsparing and unrelentless. He made sure the infrastructure does not suffer. When Mr. Gadkari created the Mumbai-Pune highway, I just saw Ajit here somewhere. When he created the Mumbai-Pune expressway, we did it in three and a half years. And today, 10 years after the highway was made, or actually 15 years after the highway was made, you can still go at 150 kilometers an hour. Because the man was honest about implementing it. He was honest about the quality that he implemented and created world-class infrastructure way back 15 years ago, when such projects were really only a dream for us. So I think connectivity, whether it's air connectivity, road connectivity, or rail connectivity, can be that one driver, and again, job creator, which can move the needle on the economy, take us back to double-digit growth. And all of these projects will have to have the subterranean overlay of good governance. Good governance is possible in this country. Mr. Modi, our prime ministerial candidate, has demonstrated what good governance is in his own state of Gujarat. Our leaders in Madhya Pradesh, in Goa, Chhattisgarh, different states have been role models of good governance. We have run honest governments where you can actually get work done without greasing palms, where there's equal opportunity for everybody. And I personally believe the time is ripe for change. Let's look at a change which is not half a change, Let's look at a change which gives a government stability of tenure, stability and possibility to implement its policies and programs, which is why we as a party are not looking at getting 200 seats or get satisfaction even with the 220 or 240 that opinion polls seem to suggest. We are fighting this election to give Mr. Modi an absolute majority, which I had launched as Mission 272, way back in July, on 26th of July last year. And I promise you we are committed to give India a good, stable government headed by a decisive and visionary leader and bring back the days of glory to India. Thank you very much.